Yeah, say this with me. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You're welcome out there. You're welcome out there. Say, Jesus, you're welcome here. Jesus, you're welcome. Put your hand on your heart because it's not just in here. He's made you the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit goes with you. The Holy Spirit is here because you brought him with you. And he goes with you in every place you place your foot. And it is his, amen? And so we recognize that the same power that rose Christ from the dead dwells in us. We cannot remain the same when we give our attention to him. So let's just give your attention to him and say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Say, Jesus, you're welcome here. Father, everything you want to do all the people you want to save, and however you want to partner with me, I say yes today, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Hey, um, we are going to, we're in the middle of a series, and I, I'm tempted in our one service to kind of shift, but what I, I, what I want to continue in the series of stepping into the supernatural. Anybody want to step in further into the supernatural? During the Joy Conference this year, uh, the language came that, that we're, it's time to go deeper into the river. It's time to step further into the river. And um, I just want to encourage you today that, that um, with God's word on the topic of supernatural expectation. How many know we can have supernatural expectation? Today, let's lift our eyes. Let's set our expectation on God's word. Let's not just talk about it. Let's be about it. I want to step, I don't want to just talk about and preach about supernatural expectation. I want to step into supernatural expectation. Whatever's going on in your life, I just want to take a moment for you to take inventory. Areas that you need to see God. Just take a moment. Maybe it's one or two or three things come to your mind. I need to see God in my marriage or I need to see God in my finances. I need to see God in my children. I'm, I'm looking for God to intervene in my community, I'm looking, whatever it is, just take inventory of your top two or three things that you need God to intervene in. You're believing God to intervene in. Now I want you to declare this with me. Declare this to Holy Spirit that dwells in you. Say, give, I want you to give him permission. So we're going to say this. Holy Spirit, you can realign my vision and supernaturally adjust my expectation. That's what I believe God's going to do. If, if, you're, if you have your Bibles in here, which I encourage everybody to, the word of God is alive and moving in here. Turn to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1. While you're turning there, I want to catch up on who Joshua is. Joshua is the guy, he's the next guy up. He's the, he's the, the leader after Moses passes to take God's people into the promised land. He is plan B. He's the backup prophet. Joshua step, steps in after Moses is lifted up and goes to heaven uh, his job is to refire the, the children of Israel who are in a 40 year losing streak of attaining God's promises. This is the job that Joshua gets. His role is to finish the journey and lead the Israelites into the promises of God. How many know it's good that God doesn't give up on his promises? When everybody else, when a whole generation had given up on God's promises and were content to live outside of God's promises, God was not content to let them live there. He raised up a Joshua. And Joshua gets to lead people in. I I, I I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. And in 1999, we saw plan B come to fruition in, in the name of a quarterback called Kurt Warner. Kurt Warner was not our plan A. We were excited. The St. Louis Rams were new to, new to town. We had lost. They had lost in L.A. They were losing in St. Louis, but we had a new coach and a new quarterback and everything, and an incredible. We had just traded for Marsh, uh, Marshall Falk from Indianapolis, and it was going to be a year to remember. And something happened in, the, in, in uh, what, what do they call it, pre, in the preseason, our main quarterback went down with an injury, and so did our hopes for the season. 
And it wasn't our second string quarterback. He was also injured. And so our plan C was a, it's become a famous story now, but he was bagging groceries at the local grocery store and they recruited him to play quarterback for the St. Louis Rams. And it looked like we were gonna have the season like every other season. He wasn't playing A, he wasn't playing B, he was playing C. But what happened that year was he became the MVP of the Super Bowl, won the Super Bowl and established in St. Louis what we know today as the greatest show on turf. How many know God can use a plan B just as well as he can use a plan A? Plan A had talent. I don't know what plan B had, but plan C was a man submitted to God's plan who wouldn't give up. And even though nobody else expected anything from him, he expected God to intervene on his behalf. There's a whole movie about it. It's incredible. But I, we got to live this uh, incredible time where we went from being the most losing franchise in the league to the most winning franchise. And we went to back-to-back Super Bowls until somebody named Tom Brady came and uh, <laughs> beat us. How many know God can use your situation and where you're at? God wants to realize the promises of God in in your life. You can't camp in the place that you are and realize the promises that you don't have. This is his word to to the Israelites. You can't stay in the wilderness and expect God's promises. You have to go. Write that down, someone. I gotta move. God's calling me to step forward and move ahead so that I can receive the promises that he has for me. God's promises for you are found in the journey forward with the Holy Spirit. Joshua leads them into the promised land, but first he would have to lead the Israelites to face their biggest giant, the battle that they could not get past, the battle that they refused to face. Why did Joshua, why why Joshua? Because Joshua were trusted first. Joshua trusted when nobody else did because he was one of the few who placed his expectation upon God's faithfulness and God's promises, not on the outward condition. Guys, that's what we are called to do is to supernaturally have a revelation of who God is and his faithfulness and put that into, into expectation upon our circumstances. We need a church in America that is expected upon God, not upon a politician. We need a church in Wichita that's ready to take uh, dominion over what God's given us and willing to go to the places he's sent us. Victory comes through faith in God and obedience to his words and obedience to his scripture. Okay, let's read in Joshua. Joshua The third chapter, verse one, says Joshua was up bright and early the next morning. They broke camp and Joshua led the Israelites to the eastern bank of Jordan and they set up camp and they waited until they crossed over. After three days, the leaders of the people went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. Watch for the priest of the tribe of Levi to lift up the Ark of the Covenant, Yahweh your God. When it starts moving forward, follow it. What is the direction? The Holy Spirit is present in the ark, but the Holy Spirit here, now I want you to understand the difference, okay? The Holy Spirit moved, as he moved them out of slavery, he moved freely. He wasn't, he wasn't in a temple, he wasn't in an ark. He moved freely as fire and smoke. Now his presence is in an ark and he's moving men to move him forward. That's what God is still doing with us. He is moving us to move, him, to move his plan and his kingdom forward. He's using you, high priest, his sons, his daughters, and directing your steps to see his kingdom established. We have to move to see him move. So the priests pick up the ark and they move, him fo- they move the Holy Spirit forward. And it says, when you see the Holy Spirit move forward in the ark, when you see the priest lift up the ark, move with them. When it starts moving, follow it so that you'll know the way to go. Since you'll never 
since you've never marched this way before. You've never gone to the, the place of God's promises like this. You're going to have to follow the Holy Spirit. Follow about a half mile behind the ark and don't go near it. How many, this just shows you the, the holiness of the Holy Spirit that dwells in you. He couldn't get close. There was strict protocol to the holiness of the Holy Spirit. And we have that same holiness, that same spirit dwelling on the inside of us. Joshua instructed the people, get yourself ready. Set yourselves apart for, for Yahweh. Tomorrow, Yahweh will perform great miracles. Joshua told his priests, raise up the Ark of the Covenant and step out ahead of the people. And so they lifted the Ark onto their shoulders and marched in front of the people. Yahweh said to, said to Joshua, this very day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel so that they will realize that I am with you in the same way I was with, with Moses. What is Joshua doing here? Before they can go fight a battle to attain their promises, they have to first set their expectations and their hopes on God. You guys, this is crucial. We can't, we, we, we walk around and we can speak the word, we can pray every prayer that we've, but if our eyes and our expectation aren't on God, we fail before we even enter the battle. We've got to have a supernatural expectation. We've got to let the Holy Spirit that's on the inside of us raise up an expectation that says, but God. I know you may feel this certain way. I know you may have had a long journey. I know your marriage may have been through it so many times. I know you may have seen the condition of the world, but God. When God will move, he'll raise up his priest to move with him, and we set our expectation on what God is doing what can't happen? When we started this journey for Care for Every Family and, and they started saying things like, let's eliminate the needs, the foster care needs in Sedgwick County. Can I tell you the foster care needs in Sedgwick County are greater than almost every other county in the United States. We're one of them, we're, we're, we're one, we, we set the record for it. But it, when we say foster care, we, th we think about a system, but when we say children, it starts to get real personal. When we realize that there's a need here, God moves us into that need. And we say, when we look at it, when we started to step into it, I was like, man, I know we can make a dent in it, but I don't know that we can eliminate foster needs in Wichita. Like in the natural, I'll just be really honest, when I'm naturally evaluating, I'm like, hold on, don't sell it too much. But then I start looking at God. And I start looking at his bride. I start looking at his people. Won't God do it? Won't God use us? Won't God bring, well, I don't know. <laughs> There's been a lot of church movements and all of them have failed. They're not still going today. What's gonna be different about this but God? When a, when, when a bishop comes to town and he says the revival that you're waiting for is sitting in the hospitals and they're, 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 they're in the form of children that we can receive all of a sudden, when I, we, we start to think about it differently because it's something we've prayed for so desperately. God, we want to see you move again. And he's saying, pick up the ark. Move with the Holy Spirit. Change and raise your expectations. Is this good for anybody? Get ready because God's going to do something unbelievable. This is what Joshua is saying. And, and it stands out. Get yourselves ready. Set yourselves apart. For Yahweh will perform great miracles among us. Get ready, because God's going to do something. I'm telling you, we're going to end this service, and you're not going to be the same as you were when you came. Your expectations on your family aren't going to be the same, because you've given permission for, I heard you say it, you gave permission for the Holy Spirit to change your expectations on the outcome. When we do that, well, I'm, you know what, I'm going to stay around for a little while and see how it goes. I might grab some food. No, no, no. You're on mission and assignment. Next thing you know, you've been outside for five hours, and he's given you the fall weather so you can minister endlessly to those that bike by, walk by, come by, and they get to see the glory of God on you. We give him permission, and then we follow him. I love that statement. Follow him because he's taking you to a place that you have not been before. How are we going to get into the promises of God? How are we going to see miracles after miracles, signs and wonders? How are we going to see the supernatural? You're going to have to stay following the Holy Spirit. 
Because the Holy Spirit is going to take you to a place. I'm not praying that revivals of old are, are, are re-spring up. I'm praying that the new revival that is being poured out by the Holy Spirit in a place that we've never been before, in a way that Wichita has never seen, I want to be a part of that, God. What's it going to take? Only obedience, only the thing we practice every day, that we hear God's voice and we respond to it. I got to be with our staff as we prayed uh, this, this week, and uh, we, we always get together and we pray on Wednesday mornings, and one of our staff members, their daughter had been injured, and they, they came to um, staff prayer as well, and we all gathered around, and we prayed over them, and we... And what was really cool was in the midst of it, um, the staff member, you know, the mother, hears God say, just invite her to stand up and dance. And you guys, we were in the room when someone who had to get help in and out of the car, someone who had pain in a way that she, she couldn't imagine, stepped out of that walker chair that she was in, that she was brought in, and her eyes went 10 times the size of her, because it was no pain. And then she started walking around, and she's, today, I keep talk, checking to her, she's like, there's a little bit of pain, but Wednesday night, she's playing volleyball, what's happening? God's doing something and taking her to a place, and we're raising expectations. What, 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 what happened? She, we had to stop what we thought was so important and just be obedient to the simple thing. This may sound crazy, but can you stand up and dance? She's got, a, she's got a choice. I don't know that I can, but let me go to the place that God's taking me. God has a plan to deliver his promises. Do you know his promises? What if the children of Israel had forgotten that God promised them the promised land? He'd still be their God, but they wouldn't have possessed all that he intended for them. Is this where the church in 2024 is? Where we serve a God, but we've forgotten his promises? Is this where believers can be? I love him, but I don't recognize and realize how much he loves me. As a church, we, as a church, we do pursue the promises of God. It says that David was a man after God's own heart. What was David known for? Pursuing the promises. In Jeremiah 20, 29, 11, God speaks about our future. He says this, he says, for I know the thoughts that I have towards you, says the Lord. They're thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. What's he doing? There's been a, there's been a whole season of silence a whole season where they did not experience the voice of the Lord. And when the voice of the Lord comes, he reestablishes his will and resets his expectation. Jeremiah 29, 11 is awesome. Jeremiah 29, 12 is even better. It gets better and better. What's he doing? The, God, the way you've experienced him in the past, you get to experience him so much better in the future. He's not a God of your circumstances. The past doesn't write the story, his word does. We say it all the time here in the church. Psalms 27, 13, David declared, made a declaration about his expectation. He said, I will remain confident of this. I love that. Another, another said, I would have lost hope. Another one says, I, um, it says, I remain confident. I, I stay steadfast in this position. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I love, David is a man after God's own heart because he won't quit looking for God to get his glory. You got pain in your body, it's just an opportunity for, get, for your eyes to get 10 times the size, like they look like cartoon eyes. And, the, and, and can I tell you, there's, there's, there's prophecy over this house that even while you worship, we're gonna end with worship here in just a minute. That as you, as you worship, you'll experience God's healing. It doesn't have to take somebody laying on a hands, although that's how God ministers sometimes. It doesn't have to take a word of knowledge directly towards you. It can just take the person of faith stepping in and saying, God, I trust you and I believe you. And in this moment, you have the opportunity. I am your canvas. You can paint your glory. Your promises can come true. 
David said, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I love in Mark chapter 5, I'm not going <laughs> to read the whole thing, but there's a woman who, who has the, that she's known as the woman with the issue of blood. Can you imagine for all eternity, that's, that's your title? I want to, oh, the woman who chose to believe God. The woman who set her expectation on Jesus' anointing. Who said, if I could even get, get close, if I don't have to touch his hand, I don't have to have him recognize me. For 12 years, she'd seen all the doctors. She had carried the shame. She had been pu- uh, pushed out by society. And she says, my savior, if he walks by and I only touch the hem of his garment, what was she doing? She was calibrating her expectation. It didn't work on the doctors. It didn't work on my community. It didn't work in my family. But if I put my expectation on Jesus as he walks by, even the very presence of his robe has enough power to heal me. She reaches out and she crawls through the crowd, a place that she's not supposed to be, a place where if they, they realize who she is, she'd be shamed for even approaching. How many know that y- you may feel like you're not dressed up for church, you're not ready to go, but God loves your boldness to approach them even when you feel like you, you, you should be, you, you don't have access. When society says that this isn't the place for you, can I tell you, this is the exact place you need to be. She sets her hopes and she sets her expectations on Jesus. And then Jesus has this joy. He stops and he turns and he says, whoa, what was that? And the disciples are like, what was what, Jesus? Can you just imagine walking with him? Like, it gets a little little weird. He's just walking and all of a sudden he stops and he's like, someone's touching me. And they're like, "Uh, Jesus, everybody is touching you. You're like the Justin Bieber of the early zeros. I can say that because Justin Bieber loves Jesus now, right? God, let him write worship songs the whole generation. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. He says, no, someone touched my power. And he turns and he says, was it you? Was it you that touched me? And she says, yes. And not, and he, what, what's his response Joy, because someone released the power of God with their expectation and their action to move upon it. Can I tell you that's the same thing when you believe God more for your marriage than your experience says? Oh, Jesus just stops. He says, someone's putting their expectation on me. Somebody's believing me for something that they can't see, but only I can deliver. My power is being released right now. Your faith has made you whole. You guys, we got to let the Holy Spirit calibrate our expectation. Well, I just don't know. Some of us have given up because we've let outcomes, we've let situations write the story. We've taken it and said, well, if it's going in this direction, can I tell you, you, you have to let the Holy Spirit take you to a place you've never been. Your expectations are in anybody but him. Your heart is certain to be broken. In Acts 27, Paul has ridiculous expectation on God. He's uh, He's on a boat and they're in a storm. They are in a storm so significant that they haven't seen land for three days. They haven't seen the sun for three days. They've just been caught in a storm. Anybody feel like they've been through that in their lives spiritually? It says, the next day, because of being battered severely by the storm, the sailors jettisoned. They threw out all their cargo. By the third day, they even threw out the ship's tackle and rigging overboard. You'll get rid of everything that you held so dear when you're in the middle of the storm. And this is what Paul says. He says, after many days of seeing neither the sun nor the stars, with the violent storm continuing to rage at us, All hope of ever getting through it alive was abandoned. And after being without food for a long time, Paul stepped before them all and said, men, you should have obeyed me and avoided all this pain and suffering by not leaving Crete. Now listen to me, don't be depressed for no one will perish, only the ship will be lost. Everything looks like they're all gonna die together and Paul steps in and he's like, first of all, you didn't have to go through this if you would have only listened. Some of us just need to pay attention right there. 
because we're pursuing the desires of our flesh and it's okay. Nobody can argue with it. It feels like I, I deserve this or I can get this because this happened. I can now do this. And there, we're, we make decisions based upon our, our situation. And Paul said, if you would have just listened to God, we wouldn't be in this disaster. But you think it's going to cost you your life. It will not cost you your life. It will just cost you everything you hold dear. We throw out everything. We, when we're in that moment, all of a sudden the things that we're building, the things that feel like they mattered so much, you guys can go ahead and come up. It doesn't matter anymore. The cargo that we're building or the wealth that we're amassing, that can all just be tossed to the side. It doesn't matter. It's just us and God. Paul calibrates his expectation in the midst of these hungry, angry sailors. It says in verse 25 in the, in the New King James, it says, Therefore take heart, for I believe God, and it will be just as it was told to me. Let that be said over our lives. Hey, I've read the word. I know what he's said to me. I know what he's promised to me. I've heard the Holy Spirit say that it's for me. It's for this situation. And I believe God. I appreciate the understanding of the circumstances, but I will submit them all to my heavenly Father. I will submit them all to the Holy Spirit. All we have to, all, we, we all have expectations, every single one of us. You have an expectation on how this sermon was going to go. Some of you think it's going to go long. It may not. <laughs> we'll see. You have an expectation on how your week is going to go, how your boss or your client may react. We assign expectation to our spouse, expectations to our kids, teachers, coworkers, friends. Nearly everything and everyone in our lives have all, we've already assigned an expectation to. It's powerful. This expectation shapes how you think. It even shapes how you feel. And 100%, it impacts the motivation to move forward or to stay put. That's what the people of Israel, they didn't consider the promises of God. Instead, they considered the giants that they were to face. And they said, it's better that we stay in the wilderness than we pursue the promised land. We, it absolutely, your expectations absolutely affect your motivations expectations affect every outcome. We have to be those who live in supernatural expectation. They did this research in the 70s and a, a teacher w was gone for a day and so she told her substitute teacher, she said that the, she switched some things up. She told the substitute teacher, she said, there's two children, one of them is my best student and the other one is the troublemaker. And so she left a note, but she said that the troublemaker was the best student and the best student was the troublemaker. And at the end of, the, uh, of her time substituting, she talked to the teacher again. And the teacher said, it was just like you told me that this student, the student that you said was a troublemaker certainly was a troublemaker. And the student that you said was an ace student knew everything from front to back. What was crazy is the expectation that this substitute, this is research done in the 70s, says that the power of what you expect from these children will actually be what you experience from them. There's some good parenting advice right there. You wake up in the morning thinking it's just going to be another day like yesterday, or you can wake up in the morning knowing that you partner with the Spirit of God and today might be different. What we expect, if you don't, what we, what we expect matters. It's not just about having a proper expectation, it's most often about having your expectations in the current place. David is a man after God's own heart, but he was, when he was a boy and he shows up on the scene, there's, an there's one giant up against an entire army and there's not courage in the entire army of Israel. And David shows up and David's like, who is this, this is what he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he would come against the children of God? What? What David didn't do is say, hey, I'm really skilled with my rocks and my sling. 
He didn't say, hey, I, 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 gotta, I, I, I wrestled this lion yesterday. And I, no, he, the lion and the, and, and the bear, they didn't even come up until someone said, prove why you think you can. But what rose up in him was everybody was what everybody else was missing. A whole generation was sitting on the sidelines because they had their expectation in their own abilities and what they could accomplish. And they looked to the right and to the left and they said, there's no man here that can take on that man. But David didn't look on this plane. He looked into the supernatural and he said, don't you know they don't carry promise and we are the children of promise. God is on our side and he's guaranteed our victory and even these small stones can take down that huge giant. Do you see the power of placing? He didn't say, I think God might just do it. No, no, no. He had his expectations on God. You guys, this is gonna save some marriages in here. This is gonna set some, date, some this is some good dating advice. When we set our expectations on God, we can expect miracles from heaven. David sees it in his battle with Goliath. He also sees, we can also see it as the people of Israel are entering into the promised land, if you put your expectations on God, which is what Joshua did, Joshua said, we are well able. Why are we well able? Because God has promised. You guys, when we find, you, if, if you struggle to get in the word and stay in the word, it's because you are not placing your expectations on God. You think that God is telling you, you have to do something, but when you realize Searching out the word is actually searching out the promises and your identity and your place so that you can put your expectations on par with what he's released and he's given access to every believer. All of a sudden, it's like my past doesn't define my future. The word of God does. There's, it, this, is the, this, is, this starts to enter in to this whole kingdom it's like, well, how do I get to, I, I want to walk in the supernatural. Believe God at his word. Put your expectations on him. Today, when you go out there, you're going to have an opportunity to minister to somebody. So maybe, maybe they're taller than you, shorter than you, wealthier than you, poorer than you. I don't know. But if you just step up and just begin to say, hey, can I pray with you? Hey, can I minister God's love to you? Hey, can I, I just want to, you might just say, hey, those are awesome shoes. And then after that, the Holy Spirit starts flowing through you. God starts doing something incredible. Your partnership with him starts becoming evident. So here's what we want to do. We don't want to just talk about it. We want to be about it. I want, before we go from here, I believe we've got a great mission that is, is, starts in 36 minutes. But before we go from here, we've got to get reconciled and let God set our expectations. Will you stand where you're at? And we're just going to worship in this house. I want to read this to you. I want you to get ready because God is going to do something unbelievable. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I want you to read this and see if there's any excuse, any clause. This is the word of God. Is there any way out of believing God for who he is. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Your faith is required in your walk with God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And those who come to God, have you come to God today? Then you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There's not this isn't like, well, I go to that church that believes that he's a rewarder. No, no, no. We're believers. We all have to do this. We all have to set our expectations on who he is. Walk out the plans that he has for us. So this morning as we worship, we're just going to make a time for, for this. And I just want to be really clear. This is first personal and then and you, where, where you let God do those th things that he brought up in you. When we, before we started, before you were preached, before you were motivated, before you heard the word of God released, those things that he brought up in you, I want you to bring them back to him. And I want you to say, God, show me your expectations. Water your, or put your word over this situation and calibrate what you're calling me to see.
what you're going to see is in this moment of worship, you're going to have higher hope than you did when you started. And as you get in the Word, the Holy Spirit's going to show you this week who He is and where you can place your hope. And it will get higher and higher and higher still until you believe that He is a God who's, this is what Mary said. <laughs> in Luke chap chapter 1, they come to Mary and they're like, Mary, the angel comes from heaven and says, I'm going to disrupt your your wedding plans. I've got um, something more important for you to do. You're going to carry the very presence of God. You're going to carry the Messiah. And not only you, but your aunt who is barren, she's also pregnant. And this is the decree from heaven that rises up in her that allows her to say, do everything that's in your heart. This is what's said, and it's a decree that's still happening today. For with God, nothing is impossible. With God, nothing is impossible over your family. With God, nothing is impossible over the city. With God, nothing is impossible over the churches. With God, nothing is impossible. Let's calibrate our faith. Let's put our hope in Him. And let's praise Him and pray for what He's going to do. can do, oh God of wonders, your power has no end, the things you've done before, in greater measure, oh you will do again, cause there's no prison wall you can't break through, no mountain you can't move all oh, things are possible and there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all oh, things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up
Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Cause even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Hey, I want to read this to you. I want you to, the, the, we have to move. We have to go. It's time to take our salvation and who Jesus is to a lost and dying world. This morning, I want to commission you to go encourage the discouraged. I want to commission you to go speak life to the lifeless. Bless those who have been cursed. Bring hope to the hopeless. Pray for the forgotten. Let your light shine. Just let it shine. The joy of the Lord be your strength. It's not by your might or by your strength, but it's by the Spirit of God. When you are weak, He is strong. He will never leave you, He'll never forsake you, for God is for you and He's not against you. This is the day of miracles, this is the day of blessing, this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. A prophetic word that we are stewarding over this house was released by Pastor Kit in 2000, says, rise up, O army of God. Rise up, O army of the Lord. Your marching orders have been given. 
Rise up intercessors, evangelists, prophets, apostles, pastors, teachers, givers, saints of the Lord. It's now time for our lights to unite. And an incredible, all the churches coming together today. It's time for our lights to unite and shine brightly the glory of the Lord. What an incredible honor. What an incredible opportunity to minister, to be ministers of the gospel today. How are we going to do it? Absolutely. Today is going to be historic for, I think, a couple of reasons. To be clear, uh, if you don't know what's happening today, Open Streets is our church family picnic. And for years, we have enjoyed the opportunity to do church outside, to be bigger on the outside than we are on the inside, to break bread together, to share a meal, to pray with one another. But today it's gonna go to a whole nother level because we're also going to shine a spotlight on the foster care adoption crisis in our community. There are 1,343 kids currently in the system. And I know what they need, and what they need can't be provided by the government. And that's not a knock against the government, but the government isn't God. What they need is an identity. What they need is hope. What they need is the, the truth and the word of God spoken over them. And I don't know a better group of people to go out there and be Jesus' hands and feet to the community. And when we do this together, I'm gonna invite you to be activated. I don't care if you've been to Revive. If you've been to Revive, the expectation goes even, even higher on you. But man, if this is your first time here at New Life Covenant Church, know that we are not shy with the love of Jesus. That's right. That we are motivated, we are invited, and we are compelled by the Holy Spirit to go out and love people the way Christ loves people. So there's some important information that I want you all to know. Be activated and spirit-led is my number one ask. Let God have his way in you today. Number two, um, we have a lot of different activities. There's definitely a huge family focus today. All those activities are actually free. Everything we're doing today is free, except for the food trucks. And that being said, if you have children and you want them to participate, there's a petting zoo, there's a zip line, uh, there's a bunch of inflatables, there's face painting. It's gonna be absolutely incredible. What we need you to do is you will get a green wristband outside at the family ministries tables where you can fill out a very brief uh, QR code waiver that will get your children wristbands because they will not be able to participate on anything without the green wristbands. As soon as you leave this service, out this room, we have our hosts outside that have these blue stand in the gap silicone wristbands. That silicone wristband is your commitment to participate with us at two o'clock in a unity moment where we will stand hand in hand down Douglas, standing literally in the gap for those kids in foster care to shine a spotlight on it. That happens at two o'clock, but before that, at two o'clock, we'll actually have a community rally that happens at 1.30 where the mayor, Lily Wu herself, will be here to share her heart on this important issue. So we're inviting you to stick around for a couple hours, to hang out with us. These wristbands though, you'll need eat, uh, one for each person in your family to grab a free lunch that will take place over across the street at 1812. We have a food line. We've got pulled pork sandwiches. We've got cheeseburgers. You'll get chips and a drink. It'll be great. So uh, please join us for that as well. And then we also, around the food court, have 26 different service providers and family resources. If you know of families that need help, this is the most tangible, tactical way we can get people the help they need because there's a very good chance whatever questions they need answers or whatever resources yeah, they're looking for, good. those people are here today around the food court with us. Um, and man, just be in prayer. I'd say, hey, pray without ceasing as the Bible encourages us. Yeah. I'm not looking for a gimmick. I'm looking for God to move. So thank you so much for being a part of our church family picnic that has grown a little bit today. <laughs> Every church is family picnic. <laughs> Grab the hand of the person next to you. If you're in here, somebody grab your hand. 
Nobody by themselves. Here's the deal. I don't care if it's your first Sunday or you've been here since we started 28 years ago. You are a host of this house. And you get to carry the presence of God and the love of God out of that street. And so other churches are going to be here. Will you make sure that they feel welcome? Uh, if, you don't know any, if you don't know a lot of people, today is an incredible day to get to know the person next to you. We all attended the same service. We all heard the same sermon. We all sang the same songs. We've got something to build on. Today can be the last day that you only know a few people. If you'll just stick around and get to know people, introduce yourself, let them know how long you've been coming and start to build relationship. May the Lord bless you and keep you. He makes his face to shine upon you and he is gracious to you. He gives to you in abundance. He lifts his countenance, the very character of who he is, and he places it upon you. You. He places it upon every single one of you. He doesn't overlook anybody. Nobody's not good enough. He looks at you and he says you are righteous and you are holy. Your faith in him has redeemed you and made you new. He gives you his forgiveness. He ministers peace, shalom, nothing missing and nothing lacking. Father God gave you his one and only, his very best, and he's not holding back. He gave you Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. May you grow in this gift of grace that empowers you to the very plans that he set aside for you. May you experience God's love to an overflowing measure that you minister with joy to all those around you because it's your free gift that you've received and it's your free gift that you get to give away because his favor is on you forever and ever. Amen, amen. God bless you. Hey, let's have an incredible day together. We'll see you on the streets. Woo!